Welcome to another episode of Talk to Rami Show. This is Rami, your host. Today is very exciting because we're going to talk about the startups and how to take your startups to the next level, how you're going to fund it, and the, all the process. And for doing that, I have Eric Youngstrom and the CEO and the founder is Unwrap in the studio. And he has a tremendous experience in the startups from early stage to the exit, over $400 million total. And we're going to just pick his brain on how everything is going to work, especially with what's going on in the technology. Eric, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get involved with technology? How did you get involved into what you do right now? So um, I grew up in a small town. My dad was a doctor and he, he really liked technology. And so I think we had one of the first computers with a modem I remember in that. my little small town in Yakima, Washington in the mid 80s. So, um, like, you know, I just grew up using computers and then, you know, in high school came, you had to write your papers. Most everybody used the, you know, the, the Apple IIe in the, yeah. in the high school right library. Um, and I had a computer at home and that's where I all of a sudden learned, you know, it, you know, if somebody said they wanted a two page paper, well, you didn't say what size font, you didn't say, you know, what line no. spacing, so I could make three pages into two, I could make one page into two, and, and <laughs> I was like, oh, I really like this technology stuff, so, yeah, um, just, it was in the house from a young age, and I was blessed to have it. You know, I was I was looking at your current company, which is Unwrap, it's been around for almost an, over, over two years, right? Two years now. Over mm -hmm. two years, it's an amazing company. What I think, a lot, you know, about the company is, you know, you helping e-commerce, mm -hmm. people that are going to go in the e-commerce, you know, ecosystem with the funding and actually a process and guiding them, how that's, how that works. So, um, the prior company to on-ramp was, um, shipping easy and we helped the merch, these exact same customers, these merchant business owners of, of small e-commerce businesses with their order management and shipping, right? You get an order, you got to make sure it gets from your dining room, your garage, your warehouse, whoever that customer is. Um, and what we saw a lot of times was merchants had a problem with, they wouldn't have enough working capital to pay for the shipping of a good order. And so what we started looking at was there a way to go build a finance product that would help these merchants with just the working capital cycle of the e-commerce business. Um, you know, a lot of e-commerce businesses, their cash conversion cycle is such that, you know, if you're doing a million dollars a year in sales, they actually don't really get to pay themselves because their the income, the profit they're generating is capturing inventory and sales turnover expenses. And so what we do is kind of come in and say, look, your your personal capital that's running this business is far more valuable than that. Let us power the inventory, this, the advertising and the shipping and fulfillment will help you keep that business turning over while you take your money out, pay yourself a salary, go reinvest wow. in the business, help it grow faster. Um, but now you have an additional source of capital that just solves that real short-term problem. And that, that short-term problem captures a lot of money. Um, and it, it's actually the difference between paying your salary and just having, you know, kind of an accounting profit, but no cash to, <laughs> to show for it right at the end of the year. And so we're trying to help the merchant with that problem. You are basically acting uh, as a VC and providing the process fulfillment and all that stuff under one umbrella. Well, we're funding it. You're yeah. funding it. And, and we don't we don't invest in the business. So we're definitely oh, okay. a loan. Um, and so our loans are, are going to range anywhere from 30 to 150 days, right? So they're not, this is this is short term kind of credit. Oh, short term, yeah. Okay. But you know, if you buy inventory, it takes a month for it to arrive, and then you sell it over the course of the next three months, right, that, that, that needs four months. And then you wanna pay it down fast enough so that when you're kind of a month away from running out of inventory, you can buy the next batch, right? And then when that inventory arrives, you need money to go pay for the advertising. So you gotta go pay, you know, Google ads and, and Bing ads and, and advertise on Amazon, right, to drive the demand. Um, and then you finally get that order. And then of course there's a shipping and fulfillment expense associated with that. And so we're making sure you have the funds specifically for those line items on your accounting statement. Um, and then the money that you know you put into your own business or your personal capital can now be released to say, 
Do I want to launch in a new channel? Do I want to create a new product, right? Do I want to go maybe hire a, a better demand agency who can drive more demand for the product, right? You can go reinvest elsewhere in your business where your dollars can have a bigger impact than just sales turnover. And are you just doing this with a, like a already established e-commerce businesses or somebody just have an idea, hey, I want to start selling online? Because the proof of concept, I think, is important for you guys if you want to borrow that money right. to the concept. So we we um, we fund customers. R- really, we think our customer base is is primarily our core products, anywhere from a hundred thousand a year in revenue okay. to about ten million. So there's established. We do have a product right now we're working with where if you're at your first five thousand dollars and last thirty day revenue, we have a small product that we work with those really emerging merchants with. Um, and then you know what we do is. Our software optimizes the deployment of that working capital, the amount that's necessary, and then the collections pacing of it. Um, and what we've really done is kind of taken what a CFO and a finance team would do for, you know, a, a big e-commerce business, right, or an academy, um, and we've built that structure into the financing, and then our software helps deploy against that, so that then the merchant, when they're leveraging our funds, right, is getting the benefit of not just here's cash, but here's the structure, the payment terms, the amounts, the timing of draws, okay. the availability of more funds that's really aligned with the cycles of your business. And so it then automates what, um, you know, what a finance team would do if they had a bank line of credit, right? But you can't afford a finance team when you're only half a million or a million dollars in revenue, right? You don't have a CFO yet. And so, you know, what we do is bring that, that set of expertise, right, and that structure to the business so that you're getting the funds you need from us, um, you're growing your business, and then somewhere between five and 20 million in revenue, by default, you have to hire a CFO, right? The, the, you just can't run a business without one at that, at that size. And that CFO is gonna go work with a bank and they'll get you know a line of credit from a bank that's more affordable than what we give you, and you're gonna graduate, right? But at that point, we've helped in the mission because we wanna see more of these small business owners become stable and scalable and you know size provides stability stability so we've helped them kind of graduate to the next stage of their business and we're excited to see them do that and we're going to go help you know the next band of entrepreneurs that are coming up you know and just getting going you have been working with a lot of start of during your career i was mm-hmm. reading about you that you wouldn't involve a lot of software and startups from the ground even from ground up, like as far as the concept development or what is it, what is what what we do, who we are, and how we're going. What were your what was your biggest challenge in the, all the past years working with the startups? I think just being comfortable with ambiguity, right? I mean every startup's got its unique set of challenges, right? And you and you're signing up to go figure out how to solve problems and accepting the fact that tomorrow's problem is gonna be probably a brand new one. Um and you just got to go, you just got to decide you're going to put your head down and power through it. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know that I can go point to one big challenge or another. Um, you know, currently the big challenge is, you know, we're, we're, we're raising money for on to keep scaling the business, right? And it's a, it's, an, it's, it's a tougher economic environment to do that in than a year ago and two years ago. Um, but I think even when the environment's good, right, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but really it's just waking up every day and, and accepting the fact that, whatever new problem arrives, it's just, you're, you're here to go solve that problem. And I think that's the fun thing about startups, right? Cause if you, if you don't like challenges, if you just want something that's kind of the same thing every day in a row, big corporations are great for that because they've got processes built, they've dialed all that stuff in and, and that's a great opportunity to go kind of pursue that career path. But if you like, if you just want things to be different every day, then, you know, going to a startup where the challenges change every day and the problems change every day, like, that's where you're going to kind of get that adrenaline rush. Yeah, that, that's, you know, I have a couple of, you know, experiences with the startups. I think the whole startups dilemma is all about not the product, is how the process is going to build to achieve the results. Right. I think it's all about that process, which is a lot of startup founders that are missing. They're just focusing on this is what I have and mine is better than the next one. I want to sell it, I believe it and everything else rather than, you know, as you said, you get up in the morning, you say, oh, the AI is here. Right. Now what I'm going to do, right. how are you going to adjust and adapt right. to that new thing that is going on is more important than the actual product. Well, product, 
product market fit is really important, yeah. right? You, you don't have a business without that. We doubt it. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, you actually, a product alone, even with great market fit, there's not a business if there's not the rest of the processes. How do you, how do you market it? How do you explain the use cases, right? How do you sell that? How do you bill for it? How do you collect on that? How do you handle customer support issues? What if somebody doesn't understand how it works, right? Um, how do you maintain, if it's software, how do you maintain the code base, right? And great, is it, you know, in the mid 2000s, right? You're moving from owning your servers to going to rack space and yep. then hold on, now you just go to the cloud, right? Like, like all we buy for, compu remember, for yeah. compute in the office these days is just a laptop for the employees, right? <laughs> um, you know, versus 15, 20 years ago, like- There was a server there was, rule. There, there, you, $100,000 of your first funding round was just going into hardware, right? Yep. You had to go, you had to run your own. Um, and, and, you know, all those things are always changing, right? So just, it's basically saying, hey, we're, you know, a business is the amalgamation of, of all those different teams and all those different processes coming together, getting more and more efficient, right? And there comes a point when, when you know, if we're lucky and blessed, then on ramp will be so big that it'll it will have those processes, right? And it'll be a place where you're not solving those startup challenges every day anymore. That'll be a, a great win, right? Um, but right now we're in that stage, and that's the stage of business that I really like. Startup has got a lot of different stages, as you said, but. You know, I'm sure you have been interact with a lot of founders mm -hmm. that you, you know, you talk, you interview and, you know, you, you pick their brains and everything. You know, I'm always, you know, fascinated by some founders are do better than others because of their, not only the mindset, but because of their character that they know who they are. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the, beside the product and the people, it's important that people, any startup, to go and just think a little bit, who am I, what I wanna do, why am I in it? You know, because I think that that characteristics of, of that founder is so important, don't you mm -hmm. agree with that? Yeah, no, I think, look, the, the character of your leadership team is, is critical, right? Because it's gonna in, infuse the entire business. Um, and you want to work with founders, right, who are high character people and who have a, a, a mission and a, a vision, right, for what what is it you're about. And, you know, building a business isn't a standalone mission, right? It's, it's you know, a corporation is the, the ability for a bunch of people to come together and go solve a problem. And then around that becomes a business. Um, but that's not why you got together, right? So um, leaders with high character are going to attract, you know, great talent around them and they're probably then telling you a story around, hey, we want to go solve this this working capital problem that lets more small business owners succeed, right? And the more successful small business owners there are in America, the healthier, freer, and safer America is. And the healthier, freer, and safer America is, the healthier the world is. Um, that's my opinion. Um, and, you know, so that's our mission at OnRamp, right? But the team's here because then we get to build a business, we get to earn an income, but there's also that cyclic reward of, hey, we believe that in helping small business owners, we're making the country better. Um, and in so doing then, like, it's exciting every day to come to work. And it feels good at the end of the day that, hey, here are these new customers we helped along the way. And here, here are all these other customers who've helped. And they're pursuing their dream. We actually got a, we got an email the other day from a customer who said, you helped save my business because you alerted me to, the, to a tax lien they didn't know about. Wow. Because of that, they were with the IRS and solved the problem. And we just, we saw it, we're like, hold on, this is actually impacting your business. You should go take care of this, right? It was tiny. It was like $700, right? So clearly they didn't know that, you know, you wouldn't let the IRS be upset with you for $700, right? Yeah. Like just pay the man, right? Um, but for some reason they didn't know it was going to the wrong address. And so we alerted them, they called the IRS and, you know, the next day, like we get this email back, you just saved my business. Like I, I literally, that it's gone. And I don't have to worry about people now thinking I'm not a trustworthy borrower anymore. And and that's not us, you know, that's not what our core product is, but that's us actually having a mission that says, how do we help more small business owners succeed? And so we see things like that, let's communicate that so they can they can go find a path to solve that problem and they're gonna they're they'll be that much more stable and that much more likely to succeed in the long run. Their success is your success. Correct. But most amazing thing that you, you talk about, you know, what you guys you do on the arm wrap and with the founders that that guidance, a lot of companies don't do. Right. Like that's so important. And what we do actually, and you know, I told you that as, as far as the digital marketing and this ecosystem, we actually don't sell anything. We don't believe selling. 
we believe to provide you with a solution that would work mm -hmm. for you. Right. And if it is something that you don't need, we tell you you don't need. But something that you need, we tell you you need. That you know that kind of prevent the damage. Right. Some, something like that. But a lot of companies right now, especially with all this uprising, all, all these startups, they're coming, as you mm -hmm. know, to Austin. Everybody's trying to Austin is a golden goose. They say, you come here, you know, it's the second Silicon Valley, all that stuff. But they don't know that, you know, Austin is a land of startups. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people, and I'm sure you see a lot of them yeah. here. And you talk to most of them that they're gonna, you know, be successful. But what do you think that with this new technology, especially artificial intelligence and all that stuff, eventually it's gonna hit the e-commerce too? Oh yeah. It's, it's there, I know that. We were, we were talking yeah. to one of my friends about that. And how you guys are gonna adapt and help your clients, because it's educational, how you're gonna help your clients, hey, I'm just a guy in e-commerce, but you gotta know about AI, and this is what we can, what, how you guys you prepare for that right now? Oh, you know, it's interesting, right? There's some, there's, you know, the, the AI that's getting the attention, right? Open AI and chat GPT right now is, you know, general language. Um, but then you've got, you know, these specialized AI tools for supply chain management. Exactly. Right? For pricing optimization or, or things. We like write that. your or, product description. <laughs> right. Or, or other categories, right? Um, um, I, we do have a client um, literally using AI now. He's like, great, I, I want a Amazon headline. Um, 200 characters. These are the keywords it has to include, and it came back with 10. And he's, now he's like, "Great, I'm going to go test all 10, right? And the one that works best, we're going to, you know, keep doing that." But it, you know, that saved him two or three hours of time, right? That two minutes, right? Here are your 10 test phrases, right? So, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity that's going to come with the AI on, on not just in e-commerce in every industry. Um, that being said, in our business, right, we're we're you know we're using machine learning and AI start tool steps even now to go build out how do we improve the underwriting, you know, how do we open the funnel wider for more customers while also identifying the risks so that, you know, we're not bringing bad, bad debt in that would then damage our ability to help the good debt customers. Um, and so, you, you know, this is just the evolution of, of software and technology, right? Which is, you know, we talked about it earlier, you move from having your own hardware to your own server, you know, now to rack space hosted servers. Yep. Now you're in the cloud, the cloud. right? Um, and, and these tools have come along. Then there's, you know, people like to talk about, you know, is it going to be Skynet and Terminator? <laughs> I don't know where it goes. They say the robot is coming exactly. and all that stuff, you know, you saw where the Amazon started and now where they add that they now they're talking that they're going to drop your package in front of your house. Yeah, the, you know, the drone, right? The, the, the drone, yeah. we're going that way, but how we're going to adapt to this technology is a different story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the competition, the adaptation of the speed and everything else that comes to the play. And, you know, and, you know, for the startups that you've been working before, I am sure that is different now. Oh, yeah. Well, and think about AI, right? Like, I have two kids in high school. Are they going to start writing essays using ChatGPT? That's and, a question. And, and, and is it wrong that they do? Or are they actually learning, like, hold on, how to structure a query for an AI engine to actually give you a good response is, may actually become a job one day, right? Um, that that there, there are going to be engineers where it's not that you're a software coder, but you're an engineer in terms of how do you engage um, AI engines, right, to actually get the best results out of them versus, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So, um yeah, it's it's fascinating to watch it all go down. What uh, what makes made you to kind of become entrepreneur? What you like entrepreneurship is is it is it sometimes it's very lonely, sometimes it's very scary, sometimes it beats you to your knees, and sometimes you are in the high and rise and having fun. You know, you've been there. Yeah, I've been there. You mm -hmm. know, wh why you like it? I have two answers to this question. So one, family. So my dad was a doctor but a doctor who hung out his own shingle, right? Had his own practice, he ran his business. Um, and his dad and my mom's dad were both doctors as well, small town docs. Um, and so that was kind of the family business. Uh, and my dad always told me like, you don't wanna be a doctor because you know, when we go on vacation, we're living on my accounts receivable coming in. It takes me 90 days to get paid, right? But, oh, yeah. but if I'm on vacation for more than 90 days, there's no money. 
right? Other, other than savings at that point, because I'm not, he was a surgeon. So he's like, I'm not doing surgery and I'm not seeing patients. I'm not generating any revenue. Um, so you want to, you want to own a widget factory. Because when you go off on vacation, that's still pumping out widgets, and you know you're still generating revenue. That, I like that. <laughs> um, so I and 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 then he he didn't like the way he saw medicine going. So when I went to college, I was told if I went pre med, he wouldn't pay. So I was like, all right, I'm, I, went, I didn't like pre med anyway, so it was good. I, I went a different path. Um, and then I think more importantly, if you look historically at what makes America great, it is this entrepreneurial spirit, and you've got you know, entrepreneurs who are going off and creating, you know, new industries and, and not just a new business, right, but a whole new way of doing things. That's technology. But you also have entrepreneurs who are like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go set up a commercial glass shop, right? I'm going to do glass installation for residential construction and commercial construction, right? No, you're not creating a new industry, but you are creating a new business. You're creating jobs and, you know, you, those guys and auto glass and you've got dry cleaners and, and that community is the community that's actually, you know, at the Little League baseball fields, right, has, you know, their company's name sponsoring it, right? And so very involved in the community. And and if you look at the, you know, emergence of America and Jefferson wanted, you know, every American citizen to be a, a farmer, right, and have, you know, 40 to 140 acres or 160 acres and um, that they would be independent but interdependent. Right. Like this guy's growing apples, that guy's doing corn, that guy's got beef, and you're going to trade. But you get to make those decisions on your own. Right. And how you want to behave. But you're still part of a community. Um, I just think that's a, a healthier way to live. And you can see the success of that, you know, going back to the emergence of the Greek city states and, and how Rome, when it was a republic, grew that entrepreneurs are just super important to the world. And it, it's not just Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos. Right. It is. I'm going to start this glass shop. I, I've, you know, I've got an interior design shop. All of those people are entrepreneurs, and because they've built their own way through it, right, and they pay their own salaries out of their work, and they've taken that risk, right? They just have a far different perspective on how to make the world better. And so, I just wanted to be a part of that community. One thing that I know for a fact, everybody's saying I want they want to be an entrepreneur because they have freedom, and you work actually more. Oh yeah, you do. <laughs> you you really do. And when everybody say, yeah, I want to be my own boss, I want to work less, I want to be an entrepreneur. I said, hey, brother, you're gonna work more. Yeah, I'm sure you work six and seventeen hours a day sometimes. I, I it, it's funny. I so I've been in startups now since 2004. Um, wow, <laughs> and I've you know, been the first employee hired by founders. I've been the first exec hired by CEO. And I've sat next to these founders and I've worked really, really hard. I've given them all the hours, but I work harder now that I'm the founder, even though there's a team around me because it's, it, because one, I'm the founder and two, I need to, I need to make sure that team has what they need the next day. Right. So it's, it's on me to make sure that gets there. I'm hoping that in another year or two, we're, we're successful enough that kind of comes a back down bit. a little bit more normal. You can fire yourself. Right. Um, all right. Or the board can fire me. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good that, position. Yeah, to be that's a good, yeah. Hey, go sit home. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's yours. It's your baby. Right. And, yes. And that also means, you know, you need the rest of your life ready for that. Right. You, like for me, I've got a, my kids are in high school. My wife's at home. Everybody's really supportive of this, and they know this has been an ambition of mine. That's my so entire important. Life, so, that, so they're supportive, but there's also times like, hey, it's time for us, right? And, and that's where I have to say, okay, great, I'm going to shut it off, and it's, I'm going to go do this stuff with the family now, and, and give them the time, and um, y- you know, remember that being a husband and a father is also even more important than being an entrepreneur. That balance is so important because you know. I know I'm married. I got three kids too. And being an entrepreneur, your 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 partner has got to be so so understanding of what you go through. But, oh yeah, you know. But they're gonna they're gonna help you, be with you on your side. But there is a there is a timeline that you, you know you go up and you say as you said that hey it's my time now. I'm gonna spend time with you guys. Yep. It's just it's just that sacrifice is is at both sides. But have you ever got to a point? that you said, I'm done. I want to throw the towel. And if you didn't throw the towel, what did you do? What do we want to your mind that it says, no, I want to give it another shot? I mean, I think everybody. We all did. Yeah, we've all had that point. I've, I've hit it at different points in my career. You know, I think probably for me, it, it was knowing that I had 
a wife and young kids at home, right? Like, hold on, like my wife doesn't work. So if, if I'm not working, <laughs> there's no food on the table. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm blessed that, you know, my wife wanted to stay home and raise kids. And that was the decision we made as a couple. Um, but, you know, that actually, you know, that kind of lights a fire under your ass. Right. If you, yep. you know, like, hey, this this has to come good. I've got to make this work because these three people are depending upon me to do that. Um so yeah, when it's been hard in the past, that's it. And and then now I've it's it's not just I got three people at home. There's there's 26 employees in on ramp. So wow, that team's counting on me to to deliver my part of of the bargain, right? The mission, um, and to make sure that they have what they need. And it's my job to get their you know get hurdles out of their way so they can go do be really effective at their jobs. So it, there's just not a choice to throw in the towel. Right, the towel. It, it will not be me throwing the towel in. Some it, the towel may get thrown in, but yeah. it's somebody you know, somebody else on the side saying, "You're done." Right? Yeah. There's, um, sometimes there's no option. I understand it. Yeah. And uh, do you consider yourself a vulnerable person? What I mean by that is, do you raise your hand and I said, "Hey, team, I need help." Are you one of those founders that you say, "Hey, I don't know it, guys." I need help, or you are the one of those who said you know it all. I, I think I'm the former. <laughs> I, I, th- I think there's a lot. There's a lot that I know, but I, I mean, look, I'm I'm not a good salesperson, right? And so there's a reason we have a head of sales because I don't know how to do that. I, I can't do his job, right? Um, I can ask questions around why we're not, you know, why did that work and that not work, right? Um, but I don't I don't know how to do that, right? I'm not a software developer. Right. So I can say, hey, guys, I, I want us to be able to do these things in our software and to automate these things. How do we do that? Now, I will say I think it takes longer than I wish it did. But I also know that we're actually when I when I actually look back over a year's worth of work, I'm like, holy crap, like I can't believe that much got done in that little time. Right. So when you're sitting in it, it feels like forever. But when you actually kind of step back and, and can look at the forest instead of the trees, it's pretty remarkable what a, a small group of people can, can accomplish do, yep. in a little bit of time when they're given the resources and 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 the respect and the freedom to go get their jobs done. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think I'm the hey guys, I don't know how to do this, right? Can I get some help here? Um, but for the stuff I know how to do, I'm going to go do it, and and I'm going to try to make sure that's not getting in the way of the rest of the company. The reason that I brought up that question. I have been talking with a lot of, you know, startup founders, tech guys, CEOs, and some of us, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to say that I need help. Right. And that, they don't do that because they think that's a sign of the weakness as a founder or the CEO or startup. They, I think it is not. It's, it's actually the great things that, okay, for example, I hate accounting. Right. I don't, I do not like to deal with with you know with the accounting but i can read pnl i can do chart of account, i can look at it mm-hmm. i can but as you said i don't want to do it i don't want to do it either but i'm good in sales and marketing and everything else i understand so but but some stuff that i don't know i would raise my hand and say guys i don't know can you answer this question you know i think one of the reasons that the startups they're not actually ach- achieving their full potential and holding this tech founders back is that vulnerability. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. And I think, I think the question becomes is when, when are you going to expose like, Hey, I don't know what to do here. Or you need a right? co-founder and, and for, or for what problem. Right. Because some of those problems are like, Hey, you know, we're raising money. What if we don't? Well, some of your team's not ready to hear that. Yep. Right. Um, and so you, you actually, Maybe you're not being vulnerable. Maybe that, in that scenario, you might be just be venting, right? But that's not helping your team. <laughs> um, versus, hey, guys, there's this thing here I don't know how to do, or I'm responsible for this. I'm doing the best I can. Is there a way to do it better, right? Um, I think those are just, you know, kind of, it, it's on that spectrum. So how do you how do you find the, that right happy balance? But you, not, nobody can do it all. Right? No. Nobody can. And that would, you know, affect the culture of business as well, too. Mm-hmm. And how is the unwrap culture is? How, how is your company culture is? We, we focus a lot on culture, right? Like we have a set of core values, you know, about being vulnerable, about landing the plane, right? About making decisions, about learning quickly. We're a learning organization, right? So we expect that mistakes are going to be made. Um, in fact, from a, from a cultural perspective, like mistakes are good things. So those, that teaches us how to get better. The, the, really, the only mistake is making the same mistake twice. 
right? Like, hold on, if we didn't learn from it, well, now that's just being foolish, right? But I don't mind at all. With, like that broke. Okay, why? Okay, now let's go fix it. Great. We, we now we now know that won't break again, right? We fixed the problem. Um, and so when you have a team, right, that's all pulling together, all trying to solve that set of shared problems, and it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to fail because that's how we're going to learn to make the business better. Um, you know, I think you know when you kind of read that history of Silicon Valley, right? Like yep. th- the thing that made it successful was it wasn't, it was okay to fail. It wasn't bad to fail, right? It, everybody's out there trying stuff. Some people are going to succeed the first time. Some might be the third time, but if you're going to penalize failure, no one's going to try it. No one's going to take the risk. Yes. Whereas, Hey, great. you you failed. You got back up. You, you know, you brushed the dirt off your knees and you tried again. And it worked. Like, hold on, let's let's reward that so people keep trying to take chances because that's how you're going to move an economy forward. That's how technology is going to get better. You know, that's how everything gets better. Um, so I think you know we want to. We've brought that inside of on ramp. Um, you know, we have a. We work in the office, right? Like, um, oh, you guys, you work at the physical. Yeah. Yeah, we have an office. Um, um, the you know the engineers are hybrid, but engineers have been hybrid since cloud computing started. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but for the rest of the team, right? Like the reason for that is, and I know you can build a company remote. I, 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 the, the, the WordPress automatic guys have done it right. And there's a bunch of others, big successes that have done it remote. I just don't, it's not in my DNA. It's not mine either. I, Everybody's I, saying that. I'm a people I, person. I want the whiteboard. I know. Right? Me too. Oh right? my God. And I want to hear, like if I hear over here, the sales team having a tough customer conversation, that might be a problem that a product needs to fix. Right. And then our product team has been working with sales as organizations for a long time. And so they have a ton of respect for what the sales team is hearing and what can we do in the product to fix that? And then, or is there a process change that needs to happen? Right. It's not always technology, right? There's a yep. whole bunch of different ways to solve problems. But if you actually can overhear these problems as they're happening, there's a far different visceral response to the severity of it than. At the end of the day, hey, here's a recap of the challenges I had, and you hope somebody reads that in Slack, and the emotion's gone from it, right? Um, and so I, I like the fact that we're all in the room together, we're all winning together, and when when there's a tough day, we're all there together, you know, helping helping each other get through that and get to their side of it. Um, so, you know, I think every business is a people business. What is your advice for the people that they're coming, they're going to have a startup, they have ideas, they're going to build it. I call it a foundation. Mm-hmm. They're going to build their foundation. Do you have any advice, like the process, the system, what they have to do? I'm a big fan, I guess, of, of kind of was Eric Reese and the lean startup approach, right? Where I love that. Yeah. Do things manually first, right? That don't scale and then figure out how to scale them. Um, I, I do think if you, you know, I view my startup, my journey into founding, right, was I went and worked for, I spent time with four other startups um, for, 16, 17 years before I finally found it on my own. The boot camp. Yeah, and I, I viewed it as apprenticeship, right? I got a chance to, to see founders and how they were doing it and, and learn from, from what they had done. I got a chance to, you know, be in board meetings. I got a chance to see VCs and, and learn from them. Um, you know, I worked for great CEOs um, and really thoughtfully kind of figure out how to get there. And then the last bit of it was, okay, to found a company, you really have to convince investors that you're all in, right? And so, you know, I spent, I, I started kind of toying with this idea in 2019 and we started building code in 2019. Um, and we did handheld loans to, you know, three or four different merchants from kind of fall of 2019 through spring of 2020 to prove that kind of this bottoms up data driven approach would work. But Nick built me a harness to go download data from Excel that I then just put into massive Excel spreadsheets, right, to, from their database, and and did everything by hand um, to go build a lending model, um, and did about four hundred thousand dollars in loans just on handshakes. Um, wow. Before I was like, hey, great, we've actually proven this can work, right? We have now a model. We've we've tested it. We've generate we've generated revenue on this. We've proven that. We can actually help the merchant with that cash conversion cycle. We can use this order flow data in, you know, in kind of a daily and near real time approach to track the performance of a loan, um, to, to trigger the collections, right, to then have that come through and prove the whole in and in model, right. So it wasn't taking a, it wasn't taking a, you know, a white paper to a, an investor. It was like, no, no, we've we've got this. And then we actually invested in another 
400,000 into building the early code stack out um, and getting kind of the web presence going and things like that so that we could actually go to investors and say, hey, there's a core product here, right? This is not vaporware, it's not just an idea, but we're ready to go to market now. And what we're gonna be doing with this money is actually now building a sales team, bringing additional engineers to really build out the rest of the stack, move us into a machine learning environment, right? And that was really what 2021 and 2022 yeah, half 21 and all 22 have been about. Basically, you you had the MVP and then you sold it yes. and then you build it. Correct. That's what a lot of dilemmas is comes, a lot of startup they're asking. And if you're a startup, you wanna know this, do I have to build it first and sell it or do I have sell it to build it? Which right. One? No, and look, you know, I've been, because I've spent all this time working at startups, right? I have a lot of engineer friends yes. and, and marketing friends and BD friends, right? And, and and so, you know, Nick, he and I work together at Shipping Easy. Now he's head of product at, in engineering at, at OnRamp now, right? And um, Theo, who runs the engineering, right? He he was with Shipping Easy as well, right? So we kind of got the band back together as well. Um, but because of that, right, I had early people I could go say, hey, go, could you help me with this side project? Um, so that we could actually get some early traction and go prove it before just saying to an investor, hey, you're gonna give us money to even see if an MVP can be built, right? Um, so I just, from, from from my journey, right, that was that was the way to go do that and prove it out and, and build confidence with a group of investors that they'd wanna go back that. A lot of people, it. they said, and I'm sure you heard that a lot, that I'm gonna quit my job and I wanna go build my startup. And I always say, don't do that, you know, have a job, and on the side. On the side, as you said, just build it, mm -hmm. sell it, talk about it, build it, experiment it, and everything else, and it works, fine. But don't do cold turkey and just, because it's tough, it's scary. And I'm not saying, if it might not work, that doesn't mean you fail, you can try again. Right. But the, the risk is high, especially if you have a family. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> especially if, which we, and my family was along for the ride and they were very supportive and I'm, I'm blessed to have that. Um, I, but I also think then like the other part of it, and I heard somebody else say this here day, like, well, you know, would you tell someone to go start a startup and the, or why <laughs> should they? And the answer is if you can't not. Right. And so for me, like I, I, I've been building up for this a long time, but also with this idea is I started really toying with it and, you know, I was actually excited to spend my weekends and nights, you know, diving into, you know, a million rows of data in Excel to figure out how do I go build a, an early test to go to do this underwriting model, right? Um, and to go to tech risk and to go figure out how much to loan and when to collect. I, I could not, right? And so for that, that's how I got here, right? But to just say, well, I'm gonna go start a business, but well, but then if something comes knocking that's more interesting because it's really not what you're passionate about, you're not gonna get very far. So in, until you found that, right? Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, I actually, it's it's only in looking back over the last kind of year or so that I, that I could actually recognize that in me at the time. Like, okay, great. I just could not, right? Um, but even when it was happening, I didn't actually kind of recognize it for what it was. Um, other than I'd just been on this journey that I knew I wanted to. One thing is you getting into the startup, the second thing, do you think it's good to have an exit strategy? I'm sure you have it. So um, I think the only successful exit strategy for a startup is that you are building a long-term business for scale. Um, I think this, and I know this is, I will be proven wrong. There's always an example, right, that proves the rule. But I think if you, if you build a business because you think you're gonna be acquired by Amazon, and you know you're you're doing the pitch, and, and all of a sudden Amazon says, um, guess what? You know the market's down, so we can't buy you. And then it turns out that I don't know Walmart takes a look at you, but you built for Amazon. Walmart pulls covers back and says, oh hold on, you've made a whole bunch of shortcuts in here. Now we don't even know how to put this thing into our systems. Yep. Whereas if you've built your business that says we're going to run this forever, we're going to IPO it or keep it private, but but we can run this business forever. You're building the right infrastructure, the right processes, um, the right business that it doesn't matter who wants to acquire it. They're going to be able to come in and say, "Great, it may not be a you know a perfect mesh, but you all have the teams and infrastructure in place that that can adopt in, into our environment because most big successful businesses right have built for that." Um, and so, you, you know, you may have to change how you're doing your accounting or other things, right? But you'll have that, the, the bones necessary, right, to be successful anywhere. Um, and so, you know, 
my exit strategy is we're building for long-term success. If somebody wants to buy the business in a year or two or 10 years, fantastic, right? If, if, if the numbers are right, of course we would, we would do that and, and give that return to our investors. If, if the answer is we're going to go build this and IPO it and, and help people generate returns that way, then, then we've made the right decision by building infrastructure that gives us that optionality. I'm sure you agree with this. I always tell people, if you don't scale it, you don't have business. Well, you, know, you have a job. You have a job. You have and a lifestyle you have a, business. Yeah, you have a lifestyle business. You're getting paid well. You have a good paying job. But if you really want to have a business, you got to be able to scale it. You have to build it in the way you you got to scale it. Like an unwrap, you are on your way to scaling it. Correct. You're building it that way. So I think there's a yes and no to that. I agree and I disagree. Okay. I would agree if you're going to bring investors on, you have to. Because the investors expect a return. Um, for our e-commerce business owners, right, who most e-commerce businesses aren't raising money from investors. Then you can be... Right. And, and, and so there are those of us who live to work and there are others that work to live. And so, you know, we have small business owners who have a $2 million a year revenue business that's generating $300,000 in annual profit that they're able to live on. And they don't want to get bigger. And honestly, I don't, I don't want them to. What I what I would it would be worse, right? If they just said no, I have to scale, but then they weren't they didn't have the technical capabilities, the experience to scale correctly, and then blew the business up that way. Especially if like, hold on, you got a two million dollar a year business, you're paying yourself three hundred thousand dollars a year, your kids are going to go to college, the house is paid for, you have nice vacations, you're going to pay for your own retirement, you're an independent business owner. You, yes, you're interdependent within your supply chain and your customers and whatnot, but. To me, that is the American dream. And so, yes, if you're going to raise money, you have to raise the scale because your investors expect a return and, and your business then is not yours. But if if he's, if he's that sales went from $2 million to $4 million, mm -hmm. do you consider that not a scaling and he's going to adapt? If he wants to and he can or she. The right? demand. Right. right. If, if But not all businesses have that demand. And so it's okay now, but again, that's the business owner's choice, Okay, right? Um, and because they haven't raised money from external sources, they don't have an obligation to scale to, to scale. generate the return. Understood. Um, it's their choice, right? And and so I, I wouldn't say that everybody has to scale. And and that's, let's not forget, like the number one reason businesses fail is cash management problems. Yep, cash. Well, the biggest one is you don't have enough. Um, but probably top five reason small businesses fail is they grow too fast. And this is where I would be, be concerned for that small business owner who doesn't have external financing, that they actually grow too fast. And that's what destroys the business because they couldn't keep up. And then all of a sudden they've got unfulfilled orders. Amazon says, hey, you're off the site because you're not you're not meeting the Amazon Prime promise anymore. Um, and then you've lost that two million dollar business because you you didn't know how to manage it to four. Right. Or you, you were overly aggressive about you it. You better stay in two. Yeah. Now, you know, businesses always have to evolve, right? Keeping a $2 million business probably, in fact, defini definitionally still involves growth, but it, it's in a new product lines, right? The top line might not change, but, you know, two years ago, my product mix was skewed towards, I don't know, t-shirts, and now it's skewed towards, um, you know, hoodies, right? So, you know, different products are going to grow in terms of, of what their, you know, kind of what their contribution is, right? So that's always happening underneath. Um, but I would say, yeah, for if you haven't taken and investment dollars on you, you you again may work to live in which case you're like look I've, I've got a business doing two million a year I work four or five hours a day why well, don't want anything more than that right like I want to go coach you know football for Pop Warner or or be a, be a be a you know spend more time at my church volunteering and things like that and I've got a business that allows me to do all those other things I I think that's absolutely fantastic. So I really think it just depends on that on that business owner. What is what is their ambition? But if you're going to raise money, <laughs> that's now you got to go scale. <laughs> that you got that that's because you have key. a different obligation. Yeah, yes. that's a different obligation yeah. because you have people that you have. And well, and you've sold your business. Uh, you're still part owner, but those guys are also owners, and and that's the expectation they have as their as the investment they have in your business. They want growth. And yeah. so from from what we're doing at OnRamp, yes, we're building for scale because we have investors and that's what I've been training myself to do for, you know, 30 years of my life. Um, but if I wanted to go do a, you know, I don't, my own bootstrap business, I, I might look at that differently um, because that I, I didn't sell the business. I didn't bring investors on. I'm, I have a different set of goals for that business. Um, so yeah, that's, 
you know, looking at both well, sides. Well, you guys are doing a fantastic job at well, the you. unwrap. You know, as I said, if you, you folks, you're listening to or watching, you need to take your e-commerce to the next level with the guidance and the process and actually the temporary funding to get you there on ramp. You uh, got to go there and talk to, you know, on ramp and they're glad to help you out. And that's a, that's a great company. Thank you so much. I Thanks really appreciate it. I learned so much. Every time I talk to people, I learn the most. And I know the listeners, the viewers, they learn a lot, but this is very educational for me as well. But Well, thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It's been a, it's been a great conversation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.